So I'm going to talk from the stance that I think participating in these endeavors is part of being professional in the current era. And my subtext is, this is how people communicate. This is how people engage. All of our employees are doing this right now, whether we want them to or not. And blocking won't work. For the hospitals that do block at the firewall, everyone has a smartphone, which you can easily use to bypass the Wi-Fi. The majority of our patients are participating in social media, and ignoring them is not going to be an option for us. If we can bring these two groups together strategically, our human bandwidth and our patients, we can be quite successful. But the difference between them being a liability and asset is going to be driven by our guidelines, orientation, and our training. Now, I think this is a unique moment in history with two powerful overlapping trends. The first is information overload that all of us face in healthcare. At the same time, we have information transparency. The second is less time for the intimacy of a patient-provider interaction as our patients spend more time online. Let's talk about information first. So PubMed has up to 22.7 million citations now. That's one new citation every minute. For my practice, which is predominantly heart failure, there are 200 journals that are germane for a clinical encounter. I went to the National Guideline Clearinghouse to search for heart failure and specific guidelines. There are now 470 that are listed that I could, I could be expected to be familiar with. And more and more of that information is being made available online in a transparent fashion every single day. So who's the lived expert in the room? Moreover, all of us struggle on a daily basis with time demands. For providers in private practice, they're spending up to a third of their day in documentation now. For medical residents in training, on average, nationally, it's six hours a day, a two-fold increase in the last 20 years. And it's not just physicians. This is one of many time motion analysis of floor nurses, looking at how their day is spent. This is a 10-hour shift, 2,000 nurses, 35% spent in documentation. Med reconciliation, care coordination, assessment of vital sign documentation, that leaves 20% for direct care. So we don't have the time we used to for the intimacy of patient-provider interaction. At the same time that's happening, all of our patients are online, <laughs> spending more and more of their time. One in four minutes in the US in social networks. One in seven minutes on Facebook. The value of that conversation is dependent on two factors. Access to the conversation, getting online, and the quality of knowledge shared. But too often, we in healthcare don't want to do this. We worry about being sued. We worry about liability. We worry about who's going to reimburse for my time online. We worry about PI compliance. But there are real implications of us sitting on the sideline that I think are catastrophic. Think about vaccine hesitancy. So in the United States, and I have a five and six-year-old, this is something we deal with on a regular basis, the average conversation regarding a vaccine is now up to five to 10 minutes in primary care. By 24 months, that's 14 vaccines of rate visits. 80% of primary care providers report one refusal a month. 8% report one out of 10 patients, parents, refused a vaccine. And there have been numerous lawsuits brought by parents whose kids become ill when they refuse to vaccinate them. Moreover, the 14 years since Wakefield's study was published, suggesting a connection between autism and vaccines, there's been a marked drop in MMR in the European Union. 2011, the outbreak of measles affected 33 countries to include 10,000 sufferers in France alone. So the American Pediatric Association has 60,000 members in it, 60,000. What if this year each one of them made one tweet, one blog post, one post on Facebook about this issue? Who would be the moral authority, us or Jenny McCarthy? I think we have an obligation to participate where our patients are. I think we need to fill the void of misinformation and do so in an effective fashion. Each of us are the lived experts of our own disease. All of us will soon have access to the same shared knowledge base to work from. If we're strategic and careful, we can partner with our patients and walk with them online as well as offline. We can shape the conversation, leverage the information, and make sure incredible content fills the void. Now, there are, there's always a talk about what are the risks, and the risks are real. There was somebody to guide that conversation. This is from the FSMB, which I think we're all familiar with. Most boards responded. 90% of boards reported at least one online violation, although these were a, a small percentage of total board actions in the FSMB database. But look at these, the top three with me, will you? Inappropriate communication online, internet prescribing without a relationship, 
and misrepresenting credentials online. Those are the top three that have been the top three for quite a while. This isn't because of social networking. People have done this before we had Twitter, Facebook, the internet. Social media tools did not cause those violations, but they do advertise with a much wider audience, educate a much larger group regarding the transgressions. So it is important to be salient of these issues, but it's also important to have a cognizant and reasonable approach to how to be professional online. So let's walk through this. Before you begin any social endeavor, before you start, develop, and review, develop or review your organizational social media guidelines. Define the opportunity and operational goal. We talked earlier about Pinterest in your survey. Pinterest has a different market penetration than Twitter does, different user demographic, different share rate than Twitter does. So you have to pick the right tool for the audience you want to, you want to play with. Remember, you represent your organization as well as yourself at all times. And please review your privacy settings. Facebook changes them on such a frequent basis, it's kind of scary. After you start, when you're online, be real. The BS detector online is incredibly astute. Be professional, be respectful. And I love lurkers, I really do. I think you gotta learn the rules of the road before driving. And this is the most critical thing I can tell you. Like a good marriage, you'll be judged more by how you listen than by what you say. For your first post, or for any post in a social network site, think about three things. Who is my audience? Who's, who's receiving this information? Is it appropriate for all ages? Am I adding content that has value to an ongoing conversation? And here are my rules that I've tried to make rhyme. Unless it's in the cache, you can't put it in the trash. You cannot delete what's online. You really can't. You can always be screenshot. Always surmise that the HIPAA applies. The of PI violations occur in the elevator, not online, but always surmise HIPAA applies. Speak on your behalf, not that of your staff. My, my user profile says these tweets are mine, not Mayo's. Anonymity is really gimmicky. I think being anonymous online is quite dangerous, and it's also unrealistic. Uh, none of us are anonymous online. How many remember the, CR, the CCT video clip from last year of a woman in uh, London? She walked by a trash bin, pet, uh, was petting a kitten, picked it up by the scruff, dropped it in the trash bin, then walked off. The whole video clip was 12 seconds in duration. You couldn't see her face that clearly. Do you, do you know what, any, 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 anyone, any of you on Reddit? Do you know what 4chan is? So 4chan is below Reddit. It's, it's the place you don't want to go. But it's, it's where anonymous and hacktivists live. They love cats. You do not mess with cats. Within 24 hours, they knew who she was. They had contacted her employer. They posted her cell phone, phone number online, her email address online, her home phone number online. Nobody is anonymous. So I think being anonymous creates a false sense of security that's unrealistic. You chat about your company, identify abundantly. So if I say something about Mayo Clinic, I let people know that I work for Mayo Clinic. Don't endorse as a matter, of course. Supervisors, do not initiate an employee friend request at your own behest. So if I supervise someone and they want to friend me, that's fine. I can decide if I want to friend them or not, but I don't seek them out. It's an unequal transaction. Separate the circle of, your circle of friends from the patients you mend. So for me, on Facebook, I use the, the bread rule and the Christmas card rule. If you're on my Christmas card list, and if I break bread with you at my house for dinner, you get, you, I'll friend you on Facebook. That's a small population of people that I'll friend. The rest of them I don't friend on Facebook. Corporate logo and username is a no-go. Adding a disclaimer is probably saner. Again, mine is, these tweets are mine, not Mayo Clinic's. And finally, don't practice on the internet, regardless of your good intent. So uh, uh, someone will tweet to me, um, I started lisinopril. Do I need to get any lab work done? I might respond to them, you know, we often will suggest when beginning an ACE inhibitor, check creatinine, creatinine and potassium in two weeks, but I can't address your case. You have to talk to your primary care provider or I can see you in clinic. I don't practice online, though. We're going to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But if you have a policy, if you provide your employees orientation and training, and if you remember, it's one game in a season. See, it's another sports MLG. I wove that in there. And because everything's got to be tweetable, this is my tweetable social media policy. Don't lie, don't pry, don't cheat, you can't delete, don't steal, don't reveal. So for those of you who are interested, we do offer a variety of training modules. We put on six social media residencies a year at our three sites. We're going to do our first one off campus uh, in New York next week at Lenox. Um, these are the rest of my staff that I work with, just some of their photos. They're just great people. 
And we published a book called Bringing the Social Media Revolution to Healthcare from our Center for Social Media. And finally, every fall we have an annual Healthcare Social Media Summit, which is in Rochester, Minnesota, beautiful Rochester, Minnesota, uh, in October. So that's the lay of the land, our progression into social media. I've provided some case studies of practical use. We've talked about professionalism. I can be found on Twitter. That's my email address. This is where I blog. This is my Pinterest page. That's our Facebook account. I'd love to hear any questions you might have. Thank you.